I was gonna tell you, um, I wanna make a pitch. That movie Informant, where it's not just, it's, I, I didn't make the film, I'm just in the film, but it talks about the war on terror, and it uses one one informant as an example in that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set, do a setup about it, and then we, and anybody who watches the film, then we can talk about the real surveillance state and what it means, not a conspiracy way, not anything. I will give you tools to deal with this. As you will learn, I was under investigation by the FBI for 10 years in, um, in, in nine states. And I'll talk about that as I go. But anyway, you should come to the film tonight because it's very instructive if you haven't seen it. It was a very, it was a pretty big film on the indie film circuit. Um, but anyway, I didn't make it, I'm just in it. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, well first I'm going to make a couple of pitches. So, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is in my book, Black Flags and Windmills, uh, which is about uh, building power from below. And it's, uh, it's not just ideas, it's practical history and some of my experience in doing that. I've built, in the last 20 years, I've built four worker cooperatives, I've built 15 organizations, and, uh, and I've done a lot of things. Um, but this book is not about how badass I am, it's about how we can all do these things. And also have, um, and these are available for 12 to 20 dollars in the Ulta Expo Tender. I've got a few of them here. And I've got this book, which is a, an essay on anarchism, and it's in English and Spanish. It's just an essay on that, and that's three bucks. So I've got those for sale. I'm on a book tour right now. Uh, my name is Scott Crow. I'm a longtime community organizer. Uh, I'm an anarchist. Uh, I've been doing stuff since about 1985. And I want to tell you a bunch of stories today. And the stories aren't so you'll leave here thinking I did things that you can't do or that movements did things that we all can't do. But hopefully you'll see how we can all build power together in our communities to, to change the world. And I hope that you see the, you see yourself in these stories and when you go back to your communities that you will build power the way you see fit. And that we don't need governments, that we don't need um, corporate uh, entities to rule our lives, that we can, we can do things ourselves. And so, um, and also I'm going to talk a little bit about the ideas of anarchy coming from a leftist social position because that's where I come from. Um, and within this, uh, I'm going to talk about Hurricane Katrina, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the surveillance state, but not that much. So, are y'all with me on this to go on a journey? Yeah, woo! Alright, All right. so the title of my book is Black Flags and Windmills, and the title of that book is a reference to the black flags that anarchists have carried for over a hundred years. Flags that we would burn if we ever got into power of any kind. Um, it's also a reference to Don Quixote. How many people have ever read Don Quixote? Yeah. So often we feel like we're slaying dragons right and left, but really we're just tilting at windmills. And it's just a reminder to be humble in what I do. So, and so that's where I come from. But like everybody, my story starts, I'm going to tell you a little bit of personal history, is that I grew up in a rural area outside of Dallas, 30,000 people. There's a factory and farm town. And like a lot of people, um, I saw that there was a cognitive <coughs> dissonance in the world. Why was it that my dad went to prison, my uncle, my cousins? Why, why was this happening? Why did it not look like the families on TV? Why did it not look like the greater wide world? I didn't have any understanding, but it started to make, it started to explore these ideas. And um, one of the things I also thought was like, even though we hunted and fished, why was it that people wouldn't destroy the natural world around me? And so it started me on this journey. And in 1985, I went to my first protest. And before that, I'd only known about giving our power away to these politicians, to vote, uh, to vote for people 3,000 miles away who had no connection to the world that I lived in at all and looked like something that I'd never seen before. And so in 1985, I went to a protest and I got to see the power that we can build together, that we can resist exploitation and oppression. And that was totally amazing. It was the first time, which I coined now, but at the time I saw what we have is our, these things called our emergency hearts. These beautiful things that pump inside of us, that drive our passion, and drive our compassion for the natural world and, the, and, and those our fellow man around us. And so from that, from 1985, I started this exploration. I was still voting and petitioning and, and doing all this stuff for power. But I started to work on three core issues that I've carried with me for a long time. And one was the, uh, to stop the exploitation of animals. I'm not saying don't hunt. I'm not saying don't fish, but the exploitation of animals, circuses and zoos and, and anything, factory farming, anything that was on the grid that capitalism was chewing up, and animals are not a commodity. The other one was the destruction of the natural world around us, the forests, the killing dolphins, every, all of this thing, anything in the natural world they're destroying, I've worked on for a long time. And the third thing was political prisoners. You know, I had learned that there was political prisoners internationally. We know about Stephen Vico, we know about Nelson Mandela, but I learned uh, through my ex exploration that there was political prisoners in the United States, people who had, who had fought for liberty, had fought for liberation, had been put in prison for that for a long time, and so I started working on those issues. 
And uh, in the mid 90s, we move forward. I, I'm, I'm introduced to members of the Black Panther Party. How many people know about the Black Panther Party? Heard about them? How many people think that they hated Whitey? Yeah? Nah, they didn't. But I learned two really valuable lessons from them that really made a lot of sense to me. One was that we as communities have a right to defend ourselves by any means necessary. Something that Malcolm X had said before that. Not just as individuals, but as communities. And it didn't always mean armed self-defense, but it meant that was also a possibility. But it meant that no, no corporation, no government, nobody could come in and tell us in our communities what to do. And I thought that was a pretty powerful concept. The second concept that I learned from them was survival programs pending revolution. So, by the 90s, I've been an activist since 1985. What we were doing is working on single issues. People are working on animal rights issues over here, prison issues over there, maybe even li liberty issues over here, whatever it is. Everybody's working separately. But what they said is that we've got, to get our, we've got to get our stuff together at the ground level and build things up. So they turned things into a political question. When somebody came to them and was hungry and they said, uh, they, they did the immediate thing, which was to feed them, right? Which is what we need to do. But they asked the political question, why are you hungry? Is it because you don't have access to good health care? So let's build some free clinics in our community so people can get healthy and get some jobs. Is it because you don't have access to education? Well, let's build some free schools, get you some education, and then, and, then, and then you can get a job with dignity and respect. So these concepts I carried with me. Um, and the self-defense one was really important because I'd grown up with a lot of violence in my house and I had rejected that violence and become a pacifist at the time. And then it really helped me to see, even though I didn't pick up guns at that point, that it was an important part of, of something, that some communities out that aren't white, aren't middle class, are under attack from the police every day, that their people are being imprisoned just like my family is being imprisoned. And so I carried that with me. And then, in, the, in 1994, these indigenous people rose up in Chiapas, Mexico, and they called themselves the Zapatistas. How many people know about the Zapatistas? Yeah. These guys took the same ideas that the Black Panther Party, which was way gone by this time, took the same ideas, survival programs, pending revolution, that the communities have a right to determine their own futures, but, one of the, but they added some pieces that were really important in this, and one of them was that instead of having a hierarchy where somebody tells you what to do, that we all decide together how we're going to determine our future. And our voices, each one of our voices matter. And that if we do it collectively, we're going, to, we're going to do better. That doesn't mean they make decisions about everything. The second thing that they want to do is that they did not want to see state power. They wanted to build power from below and have their own autonomy within their region for what they were doing. The third thing is, as they said, we don't have the answers, but this is what we're trying to do, and we want you to try to do it with us. And that was, those are pretty powerful concepts because basically they were saying we're going to build living revolutions that we get to experiment with ideas. If they don't work, we change those ideas. And so I was carrying this with me. And um, in, the, in the 80s, I'd been introduced to anarchism through punk rock and hardcore. Anybody in here ever introduced to it? A couple of you? Yeah. But I rejected it because there was, no there was no political organizing in it. There was nothing but narcissism and resistance to things, to being anti-everything. But in the late 90s, I was reintroduced to the ideas of anarchy. And the, the anarchy I, I started to learn about was this rich history of people like Emma Goldman, who was fighting for sexual freedom in, in the early 20th century. Um, the, the Spanish anarchists who, had, who, had, who showed us that people can fight for liberation and by the millions and still be autonomous and work cooperatively together. Under great duress they did this. Millions of people participated <coughs> in this. Um, and then, you know, we move on, and, and anarchists were pro protesting against Wall Street in the 60s. You know, like, couldn't this, couldn't this have been from Occupy Wall Street? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I started to learn this, that there was a, this long history. And I'm going to talk about the ideas of anarchy that make sense to me because they're ideas that are common sense. And so some of the ideas of anarchy I think that are really important is the first one is that we want worlds beyond capitalism and beyond power. And it's not capitalism just an economic exchange, but all the baggage that goes with it. The social, political, economic, and uh, cultural systems that, that are all wrapped up in capitalism that create in inequalities in our world. Not rights, but huge inequalities. Um, and so I want, so Anarchists want of an anti-capitalist world. The next one was the idea that we have a right as individuals and that we have a right as communities to be autonomous. Um, the next one of that is mutual aid, that we all work, even if we're autonomous, we work better when we work together. There's more power when we work together. Look at this, like fingers by itself is kind of weak. Ow. A bunch of fingers together can begin to work together and to form a fist of power, right? 
The next one is that we want liberation. I want internal liberation, social liberation, social, political, economic, and cultural liberation. Not just for myself, but even those who have been downtrodden and we have built this country on, or any country on, we want collective liberation. Even those who I don't know. So I carry this idea. And the next one is solidarity. For any of those with access to resources who are building our power, that we should share those resources, not in a charity way, but that we should share those resources because their liberation is tied up in ours. And so communities outside of our own, that we should support those communities to help them build their power in their way, even if it's autonomous. And the last one that's the most important, which is the one that hooked me more than anything, is I didn't have to vote to be to make action, that we could take direct action, that any of us can, can take action to change the world around us. I can and we can. And we don't have to wait on others to do it. If we see a problem, we begin to take action to do that. These are ideas that I have carried with me for a long time. And so in the 90s, um, the late 90s, um, anarchism started to come back up. You have to understand that the left, that the communist and the socialist dominated the left. And I hated them, and I was, I was underneath them. I was always an underling. Like, I'd show up at a protest, and they're like, here's the sign, comrade, take it. And I was like, what are we doing? They're like, it doesn't matter, just do it. And so, uh, but in, in Seattle in 1999, 50,000 people gathered in the streets. And nobody was paying attention to it until anarchists put rocks through the windows of Starbucks and Nike Town. And all of a sudden, um, people wanted to know what was the alternative globalization movement that was rising up and what was this idea of anarchy in the United States. Now, the bricks and the windows didn't solve the problems, but all of a sudden, we started to realize there was more anarchists and people who had these ideas. And it was the rise of anarchy in the United States and, and, um, and the, the biggest rise of anarchy in the United States ever. So. And the anarchy I talk about, I think it's really important to know that it's a little a anarchy. It's, not, it's an anarchy without adjectives. There is no right anarchy. There is no correct anarchy, right? It's a living, dynamic set of ideas, and that it, ha and that it takes root. There's no ideology with it, right? And so when anarchy was rising up, it started to take the form of the alternative globalization movement. It was the first time in modern US history where people started to have solidarity with each other that weren't just related to nation states. So where people in Dallas, Texas could have solidarity with the, Chiap the people in Chiapas, Mexico, or the rice farmers in India, and give them solidarity to build their own power because they were being crushed by, by corporate governments. And so on one hand, we were tearing down these undemocratic institutions and building the first movement of movements in the United States, and the second time we were starting to build power, where all of a sudden labor mattered, environment mattered, um, all of these different things started to work together, we started to connect the struggles. But another beautiful thing that was happening is that, we, that we'd gather, tens of thousands of us would gather at these huge mass demonstrations around the United States, and, and not only were we were protesting and doing all these things, but internally we were practicing democracy, we were having uh, general assemblies, we're having affinity groups, we're having spokes council models, um, we, we were using direct action and civil disobedience. These things were anarchist ideas. It was the first time in modern US history where we had the largest sphere of influence. Commies didn't own the left. And so also, we, had, we started to form these networks of street medics. Y'all know about street medics? It was like paramedics, EMTs, doctors, nurses, all these people who want to who help people that are in, do, do it informally. And they usually do it on the street around protests. Um, another thing, other thing that was happening is that we'd get to these mass demonstrations that hundreds of us would get arrested, so we'd have to deal with the legal fallout. So we started having these legal collectives that would start to gather, and then all there would be paralegals and lawyers, and a lot of times after we would leave, they would stay there and they would deal with the legal fallout, and then those collectives would start doing know, know your rights trainings and start doing all of these things, and so these collectives started to form. And then lastly, there was this thing called Food Not Bombs. Anybody here know about Food Not Bombs? Yay! <laughs> Food Up Bombs was an anarchist project that had gotten started in the 70s, but they would come and they'd feed thousands of, thousands of us uh, during this time. But what would happen is that we'd all gather for, for a week or two, and then everything would disappear and everybody would go back to their communities. But I kept asking myself, because I'm, I'm, I'm a very curious person, and I was like, well, could we do anything with this? Could we, what, 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 what could we do with these things? I have no idea what, what's going to happen. And then a storm comes ashore called Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Y'all remember Hurricane Katrina? Yeah. It's important that you never forget Hurricane Katrina. People talk about 9-11, but don't forget Hurricane Katrina because it's in the South. It was a man-made disaster at all levels. And, um, and I'm going to talk about that. One, because of human-induced climate change is making storms bigger. And the second reason is that the levees were built to substandard. The third thing is that 
in the Gulf Coast, they've been digging for oil for a hundred years in the water, and so all of a sudden, um, they're, they, they're, they're starting to get rid of these natural barriers, these sandbar sandbars, and they're starting to widen the mouth of the Mississippi River so they can move stuff up and down the Mississippi River. All of this is allowing these bigger storms to come directly uh, uh, much further inland than they ever did before. Am I yelling or y'all can hear me, right? No, that's good. Right. Right. And, um, and so the... Uh, so the, uh, so the storms are moving in further, but here's the piece that is the hook, that is the most important thing. What the government response to Hurricane Katrina before, during, and after the storm was absolute criminal neglect. Do not forget that. If you don't take anything away from this, take that. It was absolute criminal neglect. They left tens of thousands of people to die because disasters reveal greater than anything in the United States the, 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 the failures of capitalism and the failures of the state. Because they, because if people were living there, it's one of the poorest regions, it's actually probably the poorest region in the whole country. It's actually like a banana plantation often. Slavery is still there, they just call them prisons now. And so, if people had cars, they didn't have money to, uh, to, to get gasoline, to get their cars anywhere, and if they could go anywhere anyway, well, where are they going to go? There was no plan. And the government, which is supposed to take care of us, uh, supposedly, right, that um, they left people to die with no plan on how to get out. And then they criminalized them for being left to die. Now, the reason I even paid attention to, to Hurricane Katrina, because remember I was talking about working on all these political issues for a long time, and political prisoners? Well, my friend, Robert King, who's the man in the middle, had won his just freedom uh, after being in prison for 29 years in solitary confinement. These three men, the Angola Three, are the longest held people in solitary confinement in modern U.S. history. And, and combined over 130 years. And uh, the man on the left, uh, on my left, is Herman Wallace. He had won his just freedom last year and died two, two days later of cancer. 41 years in solitary confinement. Herman Wallace was a good man. And the man in the middle, had, uh, Robert King, had won his just freedom after 29 years in solitary confinement in 2001. And the man on the right is now the longest held person in solitary confinement in modern US, U.S. history, and that's Albert Woodfox. He's been in for 42 years, and there's an international campaign to get him out. Well, why, would they, why are they locking them away? Because they're Black Panthers. They formed a chapter of the Black Panther Party in one of the most brutal and racist prisons in the United States in the early 70s. And they fought to, to, to stop prison rape, they wanted dignity for prisoners. They wanted desegregation of the prison so that people could work together. And for this, they locked them away and tried to bury them alive. For all of this, I did not want this man to die after he won his just freedom. Robert King, I, want, I, I thought I should do something. So a man named Brandon Darby, who had also gave support to King, said, let's go find King. So I had never been to a disaster in my life. I didn't know what to do. So we got, we brought, uh, we brought a gun. We brought some food, some water, and a John boat. Y'all know what a John boat is? Flat bottom boat. It's made for ponds and little skiffs. We took it into the ocean, open ocean of a storm. And the reason we did that is because once we arrived there, there was 280 other boats just like ours, with people just like you whose emergency hearts had kicked in, and they were there to do search and rescue because tens of thousands of people were left to die. And all we saw was government bureaucracy fighting over who was going to have control over the boats, and they turned us all away. So we took a boat into the open ocean with no, not, very little boating experience, overloaded boat, and uh, we were going to try to find uh, Robert King. And so we were going to end up, we, were, we took it out to the Gulf Coast, we came up to Lake, Lake Pontchartrain, and we are going to end up here. And this is one of the levees that broke. This is not the only levee that broke. And this water is supposed to be about 15 feet below there. And this area is called the Lower Ninth Ward. This is about 10 to 20 feet of water, depending on where you are in the bowl. And I can tell you what I saw was absolutely unimaginable. I can tell you all the details, all the dead bodies, all the things that I saw, but, I, but it is unimaginable. But just remember this, everything that you think you know about the world was gone. Not just your neighborhood, not just your city, but city after city, state after state, all along the region for thousands of miles. And the government left people to die. Grandmas, grandpas, uncles, babies, with no plan on what to do. And people were trapped in their attics, people were trapped on the rooftops. One of the first things that I did was I climbed the levee, and I could see this apartment complex, and there were a hundred people over there, and they could see us, and they were waving at us to come and help them, and I could do nothing because I couldn't even get to them. I would have had to carry the boat up an 18-foot uh, ladder and jump across there, and I couldn't do it. It was debilitating. 
And so we did search and rescue, and we were going to try to find King. So we were doing search and rescue. And, um, but it was unimaginable. But all of a sudden, racism reared its ugly head, which is always there in our country, but definitely in the South. Because the veneer that, keep, that kept it away was not there. And so all of a sudden, we're not able to hear stories. I mean, we can't get news reports. The only news we have is the news that we get from each other. And most of the people coming in were white men. Most of the people there are black and poor. And so all of a sudden we started hearing stories of gangsters shooting people and all this, even though I knew better. Because I had worked with people in New Orleans for a long time. And there were gangsters, but there was, but the, uh, the hold your question so later. They, and so, so people like you were coming. And so all of a sudden when racism reared its ugly head, we started to hear these horror stories. And I didn't want to shoot anybody to rescue somebody else, so we left. It was there on Wednesday, we had done search and rescue, I was exhausted, we left on Saturday. And it was the first time that I felt like I was uh, disobeying one of my own principles, which is you never leave anybody behind. I never left anybody behind in an action before. When people have gotten jailed, when we were doing civil disobedience, you waited until the last person was out of jail, you left together. Political prisoners, people who had put, in their, put their life on the line before us, or serving prison time, you make sure that you support those people. And now I was leaving tens of thousands of people to actually die. I was ashamed. I used all these resources to get there, and now I was going to, even if I couldn't have helped everybody, I wasn't there to save anybody, I was just there to try to help people, and that's what happened. In the interim, what happened was a man named Malik Rahim, another former member of the Black Panther Party, who was living in Algiers neighborhood, who was also had been organizing, um, he called me because he had heard I was there looking for Robert King, and we didn't find King this first round, and he said, hey bro, I need some support. And when he said that, I knew what he meant. Because what he said, and Malik lives in the Algiers neighborhood, which is about 70,000 people, mostly black, mostly middle class, and, low, and actually lower middle class and poor. And then there's a, a little block, an eight block area of white people, and mostly wealthy with a little poor on the outside. And they formed a militia to protect themselves, which is not a bad idea. But then they started driving out of their neighborhoods and meting out justice the way they saw fit, just like the KKK except they didn't wear the stupid little hats. And so they were threatening to kill Malik because he, had, he was already doing organizing and they kept calling him the mayor of Algiers. And they drive by in their trucks and they go, we're gonna get you mayor, we're gonna get you. So this is the situation that we're coming into. So Malik, when he said he needed support, I knew what he meant. 20 years of political organizing brought me to that point. When a community outside of my own said, we need solidarity, I, I, I was willing to take it. By this time, I'd already bought guns because Nazis had threatened to kill me at my home for fighting against them in the streets. They knew where I lived because I was a public person. I was often in there. And I, I, was re I was already ideologically that we as communities have a right to defend ourselves by any means necessary. And so I came back. So it's only seven days. And this is what I saw. Um, I saw the criminalization of people. So now, remember the tens of thousands of people who were left to die? Many of them were trapped on their attics, in their attics or on their rooftops. The water rose really quickly. So in, in the south, there's little, little cubby holes that you can get up into your attic in. So a lot of families climbed up into those attics. And then, if they could, they busted their way out and they got on top of the rooftop. So you see all the images of the people on the rooftop. That's how a lot of families got there. But not everybody could do that. Many people were still trapped in their attics left to die. And now, some of them decided to appropriate stuff from stores that had, when, when all these people left to die, they, they wanted to get food, they wanted to get water, diapers for their babies, if they want to get some liquor and some cigarettes, go to town. Nobody cared about them. Nobody. Except for us. Governments didn't care. And so now, the orders were shoot to kill for looters. Even though the New Orleans police was also looting. Because I saw them loot a Walmart myself. The next thing I saw was a military buildup. All of a sudden, now these people are coming from the National Guard from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're starting to occupy like an army. And I saw thousands of people when I came back on Monday. This is only seven days from the storm. I, when I was coming back in, thousands of people were walking down the highways because they were left to die and they were just trying to do this. And I saw a military buildup where they're starting to build sandbag turrets and 50 caliber guns. Who were they arming themselves against? It was not Baghdad, this is the United States. It was infuriating. They wouldn't have done it in Florida. They wouldn't have done it in, in New Hampshire. They wouldn't have done it. And so this is, what I, this is what I came to. So we got to Malik's, and this is the first thing that we did. This man's body is about 15 or 20 bullets in it. 
He's laying there dead. I'd already been traumatized by seeing drowned bodies. And now this is the, the, this is the first dead body I saw. And this man I could smell for two blocks. And the only thing I could do, that we could do, was to cover him up to give him a little bit of dignity in his death. That was it. And he was one of two that were within about five blocks. Well, who killed them? Was it the militia or was it the police? But either way, we knew we were in a serious situation. So two white guys from Texas, because they were asked, came into a black neighborhood and with three other guys who were called gangsters in the neighborhood, formed an armed self-defense patrol. We did not initiate aggression. We came and defended. And so we defended Malik's house. And we got an armed standoff with the white militia. They were drunk, they were in their trucks, and they drove by Malik's house, and they were shooting off their mouths. And we were sitting there stone cold sober with about 200 rounds of ammunition between us. And had one of them raised their gun up for a second, we would have unloaded hundreds of rounds into them. It all lasted about two minutes, but it was a lifetime in my head. And then, I had been thinking this whole time, what, 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 would the, what would the Black Panther Party do? What would the Zapatistas do? What would I do as an anarchist? What would we do as people who are concerned citizens who see the failure of governments and we know this? And so I've, I've been thinking and I pitched this idea to Malik. I was like, what if we start an organization and we say, we'll do two basic things. We'll help to build infrastructure that had never existed in some of these communities before. We're again, survival programs pending revolution. And we'll rebuild infrastructure that had fallen down in the long, slow history of disaster on these communities. And, and it was just basic ideas like food and water and healthcare and housing, all these simple ideas. And so from that, from this, this all this stuff, we, I, I pitched this idea to Malik Rahim, who I was talking about, and this woman, Sharon Johnson, who's a woman you never hardly hear about, who was a bookkeeper at a, at a business before this, but lived in Algiers, did not know where her family was, and said she, she said, I'll do this, and then my old knucklehead self, and we started this organization, and we called it the Common Ground Collective. And the idea was not charity. I didn't want to just help people. We wanted to build, and we were doing it in solidarity, that their struggles are just as important as ours, that our liberation is tied together, even if I don't know who these people are. And we started to tell the stories of, of, building, uh, of building revolution in the area. And people just like yourselves, whose emergency hearts started to pump, started to come. And the ideas were, were pretty basic. Like, let's just start with basic civil society, and let's build it. And let's build autonomy block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, place by place. But let's resist at the same time. And so that's how we started. And we didn't decide what was happening in those communities. We went into the communities and said, what is it that you need to build your power? How can we help you get back on your feet so you can build political power the way you see fit? And that's how we did it. And it was a beautiful thing in some ways, but we also were outside of the, outside of the state. So we were enemies of the state from the beginning. On, I did not think I was gonna live in the first few weeks. I was willing to die for what I believed in, and so were other people, and we thought the state, we thought the police were going to kill us. On three different occasions, because we refused to work with the government at all, on three different occasions, New Orleans Police Department uh, almost killed me. And when I say almost killed me, not sort of almost killed me, I had, to, I had to endure violence that communities have to endure daily, where they told me, they put me face down on the ground, put guns to my head, gangster style. Anybody here know how to shoot guns? You, when you hold a sidearm, you hold it with both your hands, you get stable. They held them like this, like they had been watching too many movies. This is the police. And they were just sitting right below your brains out. The first time I was terrified, the second time I was really scared, the third time I was on my knees. There's a 17 year old friend of mine, Jimmy, and my friend David were sitting there, and the guy was waving his gun, and he said, I'm going to shoot you. And I just told him to shoot. I said, Shoot me. Shoot me. I'm tired of being scared. Just shoot me. And he didn't do it. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Homeland Security almost shot me uh, later, and then the police raided our, our compound that they called it, which is where we were serving, we were doing food and water distribution. And so we had, a, there was a political price for doing these things, but it was worth it. Because when we told the stories of building revolutions, not my revolution, the, the revolutions for the communities who had been marginalized under capitalism all this time, and, and so people started to come. So the, at first there was three of us, then there was 10 of us, then there was 50 of us, then there was 100 of us. 
And we took another, another page out of the Zapatista playbook, which is that they rose up with arms in 1994, and then once more people came and the, and the, the media started to pay attention, they put their guns away. And that's exactly what we did, because we didn't need them. We needed each other, and we had each other. We had the safety of each other to do these things. And so we started with food and water distribution centers, and we built a clinic 12 days after the storm. We used open source technology to build communication centers. We built a communication center. Damn it, my batteries already died. Um, we built a communication center uh, from the ground up uh, within the first 13 days. And when doing that, we. Um, we, we, we had one Wi-Fi card and we were able to, to, to link 12 computers together, build a Drupal wide website for anybody who knows that, and we started, we built a mesh network. This is all with no money. And I know there was a workshop on mesh networks earlier, it was pretty amazing to talk about. And the thing is, I had imagined some of these ideas. I am not the great hero of the story. We are all the heroes of these stories. It was all of us. The people who were in New Orleans who fought for their own survival, who had no other choice are the heroes of these stories. And so and we started to bring legal aid. But we also, what made Common Ground different was that we weren't all, only building, we were, we were working this dual power model, which is you resist exploitation and oppression on one hand, but you also build and create on the other hand. So we were also resisting. So we occupied places. So anytime that Homeland Security said you can't be in that neighborhood, but people in that neighborhood wanted, to, wanted us to be there, Common Ground volunteers broke the law to go feed them, to give them medical aid, to help them build a community and said we're not going to leave because the government wanted people to leave. They wanted to restore law and order. And Common Ground was like, no, we want, we want liberation. And so, and uh, Doris Cager is this woman who owned this house, and, and, this, and, this, uh, and she had heard about Common Ground, and she said, hey, why don't you build a distribution center in my community after that? And that gave us the idea to start expanding. And so, so uh, Common Ground volunteers went into the house in the Lower Ninth Ward, which Homeland Security was all around and said, you can't be there. They got arrested. And then another set of volunteers came in and occupied the house, and they got arrested. And the third set that came in said, we're not leaving. And then we built a distribution center. So we started building distribution center in community after community by doing that, and also by talking to community leaders and saying, hey, look, if you'll let us use your church, if you'll let us use your, this building, we'll gut it out for you. Let us house people. Let us feed people. Let us help. Let's, let's, let's try to get people back on their feet. And then we, between those two strategies, we are able to move through community after community, not just in New Orleans, but outside of New Orleans also. And also, Common Ground volunteers were willing to use civil disobedience to break the law. Because, can anybody here think that laws are just and fair? Oh, I said you almost raised your hand. <laughs> Listen, all laws are bureaucratic, arbitrary, reactionary, and selectively enforced. They never help the people they're intended to help. They're always detrimental to everybody, and they're always selectively enforced. And so, what we would do is break the law for the higher moral law. Because we, we, we built it on based on our ethics. And not only were we trying to do all this stuff on the outside, but inside, we were also having general assemblies. We were using the street medics who would come, uh, you know, because the question I had had was like, could street medics come from the networks of the alternative globalization movement? Could they build a first aid station? Could the first aid station become a clinic? Could the clinic become a hospital? Those are the questions we were asking. We didn't have the answers, but that's where we were going with it. And so, um, so as these people are building, and we're still breaking the law on one hand, so we're building service and doing this on the other hand. The other thing that was happening was that New Orleans housing uh, is historically cheap up before the storm. You could rent a house in New Orleans for two or three hundred dollars easily. And it's intergenerational housing. I know people in New Orleans whose families have been there three hundred years, two hundred years, uh, you know, a hundred years, which is not so unusual to see probably people in New England, but, uh, but definitely in the South there's not people that are like that. And so, um, so housing was historically cheap. So the house, so now the housing that didn't flood became super valuable because military contractors, government contractors, nonprofit industrial contract contractors were coming, and now that rent would be twelve hundred dollars, and they would just evict the families out of it. So what we did is we started eviction defense committees to when they evicted people, we would move them back into their houses and defend their houses. And then we, while, while legal teams were also building to uh, to, to change the rules. Um, and one of the things I was most proud of was that there was a school called the Martin Luther King School, 
And Doris Hicks, who was the principal in this picture, had contacted Common Ground because she had heard the work that we were doing. And she said she had talked to the she had talked to the school board and said, I want to open the school. Now you have to understand, this is in, in, in uh, spring of 2006. No schools in New Orleans had opened by this time. And now people are coming back. And so kids are running around. We're building free schools. We have free schools in community after community, these little small schools that we have. But now she said, I want to open up this big school that she was the principal of. They said it cost three million dollars to clean it out. So common ground volunteers, just like you, walked up with bolt cutters past the police lines, cut the cut the locks on the doors, and went in and started to clean the school out. And then the students who were there came and they cleaned the school out and got the school open. Common ground didn't run the school, but we were willing to break the law. I think it's an important thing to, to think about. And revolutions aren't all about guns, guts, and glory. It's about a lot of hard, dirty work. It was crisis after crisis. And not only were we building these outward things, but we were practicing all these inward things, the general assemblies, stretching our power together. What does it mean to power share? For many anarchists, we could never be anarchist enough. For many radicals, we were too radical because we're confrontational. But the thing is, it was it, we just did what we had to do. And there was no plan. There was no leader. It was all of us. There was a core of people who were making decisions. I mean, we'd have like 15 to 100 people making core decisions about finances. But you have to understand, we also raised $3 million in the first three years. Not a single person got paid. Everything was problematic. And we kept in a shoebox largely. <laughs> That's how efficient we were. And, um, and there was nobody making, uh, making the decision. So often it was like a beautiful train wreck. We would be careening down the track, doing amazing stuff. It's like almost falling off. And then all of a sudden, all the cars would come crashing down. And we just like go, oh my gosh, what are we doing? And we just put the cars back on the track and just start careening down again. And staph infections, disease was rampant. We were sick. We also perpetuated some of the same problems that happened, even though we knew better. We started to create a hierarchy of oppression because we saw race first because it was easy to see. Class was easy to see, so it was a close second. But things like gender and sexual orientation just kind of fell off the map. So we still perpetuated the problems that we were trying to fight against. We were trying to create equal power internally. We had powerful women in the organization, but none of them were at none of them were the final decision maker. It was all three men who were the final decision makers, ultimately. And so there's a lot of problems. It wasn't like this amazing thing always. But through this, through the ideas of direct action, mutual aid community organizing and outreach, we were able to do things like this, if this will go, there we go, build neighborhood assemblies, communication centers, health clinics, legal support, eviction defense, women's shelters. We realized early on that some women needed a place to be that was safe by themselves or with kids. So we were housing thousands of people from New Orleans and from outside of New Orleans. And so we built a women's shelter and a free school, gutted houses. We did food security. What's food security? Community gardens, individual gardens. We helped rebuild them or we built new ones in community defense. We also um, did a lot of aid distribution. And we worked with Cop Watch. How many people know about Cop Watch? Yeah, Cop Watch was really important. We were able to break a lot of stories because people were willing to face the cops over and over again and their, their brutality and get it out to the media. And so we used service work, civil disobedience, and food, not bombs. Through this, we were able to have 150, uh, 150 programs or projects going on in any given week. Now, they weren't all amazing, they weren't all fun, but, they, but, they, but that's what we did. It was just basic service work. But the ideas were um, not to just own it and become like the new United Way. We would spin projects off. Like Some people were like, we want to be autonomous, and we'd just give them support and say, go spin that project off. The women's shelter became separate. Two of the clinics became separate. Uh, we had a bicycle program. And these things still exist autonomously today. Um, and Common Ground's still there. And it wasn't me, it was all of us. It was a bunch of people, um, and people who were good organizers who would come from around the country, as well as the community organizers that were there. And, any, and all of these people, 38,000 people came through in the first four years, and they went back to their communities. And so something was, uh, 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 was, was to emerge from that later. But Common Ground, like all heydays, came to an end. We had opened that crack in history where we saw power fall. And we opened the crack and we tried to widen the crack so we could build power from below. But of course, they closed it back up. And so in 2008, we made Common Ground a traditional nonprofit. It became much smaller, less people were coming. Lots of, lots of stories around. Was it a failure of anarchism? Was it a failure of radical ideas? No, it was just what needed to happen at the moment. And so today, Common Ground still, still exists, but it does things like wetlands restoration, it's building worker cooperatives, it's, it's doing um, house rebuilding, just a lot of, lot of smaller scale things. 
and that the, con the, the headquarters for Common Ground is in the lower ninth ward, um, and it's got it's a hurricane-proof house. It's got solar panels, so can be off the grid. Has 20,000 gallons of water catchment and community gardens all around it. And Common Ground wasn't the only organization doing this, but we were the only one willing to work outside the state to do it. And oddly enough, uh, we, we got a commendation from the city about a year and a half later. One of those damn things, like it was like some validation. I think I've got it in the, I think I used it for cat litter uh, or something. <laughs> well, they had tried to kill us, right? And so, like, I had no love for them. You know, they, they want to make it. But something else came out of it that, that was much larger than what I see. And, and you have to understand, I had post-traumatic stress really bad after this. I, I, none of this happened lightly. Um, I had to go to therapy. I mean, like, and there's a lot more that I'm going to tell you in a minute. But, but, the, um, but it, was, it was a really difficult time after that from all the violence that had happened. But all of a sudden, the economic disaster happened in 2008. And in 2011, people started to come together and they called it Occupy. It grew directly out of the lineage of Common Ground. Just like Common Ground had come from before, from all these alternative globalization movements and anarchist movements and stuff. Well, the Occupy movement, when anybody, anybody here participate in Occupy? All these organizers are key. When I traveled to 24 Occupy camps uh, in 2011, I saw Common Ground key organizers everywhere. Not that they went to them, they just went back to their homes. And so they had a great influence. And Occupy was 40 years of anarchist organizing in the United States when it rose up and all of a sudden nobody had to fight with communists on, on what this meant because the communists didn't own it. And all of a sudden, general assemblies, folks councils, affinity groups, and direct action made sense. Street medics, Live, free, free lending libraries, reclaiming the commons, all of these ideas come out of the left anarchist traditions. And so, but I didn't see that coming. I couldn't have told you, like, oh yeah, we did, that. I see this in reflection now, right? And then, because people had, in Occupy Wall Street particularly, when the next disaster happened, which was not, it was not economic, it was ecological, it was Hurricane Sandy, people were able to move directly into that and start Occupy Sandy. And now Common Ground, other people like myself, were brought in to actually talk about the organizing and talk about it, and it became a thing. Because now we started to realize that, that this whole thing, the disasters reveal that the failures of capitalism in the state like nothing else. And so we were able to do that. And then we worked with the Occupy Sandy people on, on Oklahoma. Um, last year, there's uh, two major tornadoes, biggest tornadoes that ever said, had because of climate change. And, um, and so we were able to work together to help those communities and, and work in decentralized ways. So, so I'm going to shift gears for a minute and talk about something else, and then we'll come back to some other ideas. I want to talk about how we moved, uh, and after 2001, we moved into the surveillance state. I'm not going to go into a big thing about surveillance, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it and how activists were, were, were targeted. How people like myself went from being a civil activist to being a terrorist. And so, um, one of one of those um, one of the reasons is because of corporate lobbying. Because we and the animal rights and, and, and the radical environmental movements were being affected at, 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 at affecting their bottom line, their dollars. And they started to take notice, so they started to criminalize us. They didn't want us not just protesting, they didn't want us to stop their logging. They wanted to continue to exploit animals and whatever they were doing. We had controversial campaigns where we were going to people's houses to stop them and stop the decision makers directly. And so we're criminalized for that. And then after they crashed the, the, the planes of the buildings in 2011, I mean in 2001, the Patriot Act was passed, then the floodgates opened. The, the, the dream world of, of Dick Cheney and all those people had opened. And so now they had to find some terrorists. So, in, um, so one of the things that happened was that they targeted largely uh, people who were in the animal rights movements, people in the radical environmental movements, anarchists, and then the, 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 but the biggest segment of people who were targeted were Muslims. 98% of the terrorism cases in the United States are, are Muslim. And think about this, there's been 500, over 520 cases tried since 2001. 98% um, of the Muslim are Muslim cases. The FBI was involved in, in over 60% of those cases, and the FBI led the plot in, in 140, no, I'm sorry, 160 of those cases now, where they brought all the material support, they did everything. And so friends of mine were basically engaging in property destruction we're, going, we're being sent to prison. Grand juries were being convened all around the country. We didn't know what was happening during this thing we call the Green Scare. But all of a sudden, people were being picked up right and left. And people were doing five years, 20 years, seven years for basically property destruction. Which is, we should engage in property destruction. Like, it's going to take all kinds of tools to make liberation. 
and corporate property destruction has a place, and state property destruction has a place. And we have a long history of it in this country, and other places have a long history, and we should remember that. And now people are serving a long periods of time. But during this time, I had been investigated by the FBI for almost 10 years. In 1999, I was first visited by the FBI in Dallas, Texas, at the uh, worker co-op that I had co-founded. They came in, and there had been some property destruction that had happened to some fur stores. I'd worked on an anti-fur campaign, and they said, this is the first time I ever heard the words animal rights and domestic terrorism together, and they were accusing me of it. So it started an odyssey that ended up where I was under investigation since 1999. I was investigated in nine, in nine states and 13 field offices by the FBI. Um, they had tapped my phone, they had gone through the internet. I had six informants in my life. Um, and the reason I know this is because we did Freedom of Information Act request. You remember the man Brandon Darby I was telling you about earlier? In 2008, the Republican National Convention in Minneapolis and St. Paul, two friends of mine went with Brandon and a few other of our friends to protest it. My two, my two friends built Molotov cocktails to, um, to throw at empty police cars. They changed their mind. Now whether it was a good idea or not, whatever, that didn't happen. But Brandon Darby turned him in. And it turned out he was, had been working for the FBI for a year and had been leading to a setup for that. He had also tried to get me to burn down a bookstore in 2006. And I didn't do it, otherwise I'd be serving 25 years for it. Because arson is only five to seven years. Arson with political intent is 25 years, and with a domestic and terrorism enhancement, you could even get 40 years for it. So they're, they're tapping my phone, and remember Herman Wallace I was talking about at the Angola 3 earlier? I was kicked off of his list for visiting him after five years because of information from the FBI. They didn't charge me with any of this. They, they tried to indict me three times. Um, they, and, and the thing is, I didn't know all this was going on until I got my documents in 2010. But they tried to find me as a, they, they, they wanted three things. They said I was a nexus of terrorism. I was, uh, one, was that a nexus of terrorism means that you're taking international funds and you're funding domestic terrorism in the United States. The second thing they said is I was stockpiling weapons. Well, damn it, y'all, I'm from Texas. We have guns. <laughs> the third thing that they said was there had, been, there had been property destruction committed by the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front. And there, some of them had been arson, but most of it had been vandalism, and they tried to accuse me of it. Some of the stuff that they said I had done, I would have had to been in two states that were not co-joining at the same time. And for this, I had six informants in my life, and Brandon Darby just happened to be the last one. He was the second person who tried to put me in prison, who tried to get me to commit a crime that would have put me in prison for 25 years. And so, but why would they do this? Well, if you're going to have a war on terror, you've got to have terrorists. Right, and because they, they, they started to target animal rights people, they started to tar target um, they started to target uh, earth liberation people, people who were radical environmentalists and anarchists, and I won and, 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 and Muslims, like I mentioned earlier. So I was in three of the four categories. I justified their budgets. But what I realized during this is that the ATF, when they were threatening to kick my door in, and the FBI was coming around regularly, um, that that we had to do something. I had to figure out what to do. because, um, And so I started sleeping with a 45 under my pillow because they had a history of killing people. And so I said I wasn't going to go out like that. It wasn't rational. It wasn't reasonable. But that's what I did. And then later, a friend of mine was like, well, why don't you just have a camera? So about a year later, I traded my gun for a camera. And they're like, if they bust in, just start filming them. And I had lawyers by then. But, the, but I am fortunate. I am grateful. Because of all the things that have happened, I'm standing here today. And I'm able to tell you these stories, whereas other friends of mine didn't, and they, will t they can only tell you those stories after they get out of prison. And the war on terror is a war on us, all of us, political dissidents and everybody in this country. It's, it's an excuse for the surveillance state because they're, because they're afraid. But remember that we're paper tigers. And you know how you can tell the government's lying? Their lips are moving. <laughs> so remember that. And I still continue to organize. Um, I'd already built two co worker co-ops in, in the last 20 years, and by this time after 2006, I started another one. I didn't start it, I just came into it and, and horizontalized it. And I worked at an anarchist worker-run recycling center. And I started a thrift store because I'm tired of us being on the non-profit industrial complex thing where we have to beg for money all the time, I have to beg for money from our friends. I think we should generate our own money, which I know a lot of people in this room did agree with. And so we started a thrift store that not only generated money for itself and created a worker cooperative where four women can work there and be paid a living wage and have benefits, but we also 
send $1,200 a month in solidarity to another anarchist organization in Austin that does free, business, free books to prisoners and has done it for 20 years and always and nobody wants to give money to that and we're like we'll give you $1,200 a month to pay your rent every month to do your thing and then also give away $2,000 a month to other other projects that nobody else will give away and also collect stuff and give out, give out material aid to everybody. And then, I, I, and then after that, because the FBI didn't put me down, I started talking, and I just used my voice to tell, talk about the war on terror and what a sham it is, and, then, and do that. And I still do political prisoner support. You remember Robert King I was talking about earlier? My friend, he lives down the street from me, and I love King. I see him all the time, two blocks from me. He has a house now because a bunch of people after Hurricane Katrina bought him a house, and I still do support for him. He travels internationally talking to people about political prisoners, about the Black Panther Party, about solitary confinement. And he and working for Albert's Just Freedom. And oh yeah, I wrote a book too for Black Flags during this whole time. So I didn't lay down and die. I could, I wanted to. I was so traumatized from all the violence, but I didn't lay down and die. And we should never, ever, ever do that. We should always fight until there's nothing left, not a, not a single breath left. I'm going to go to this last section now. And and so the questions I have, and I'm not going to provide answers. I just want us to think about some things as I. Like I talked about, disasters re reveal these things, and I think we ought to, we ought to, we, you know, we know that, and I think you ought to carry that with you. So how do we create engagements, projects, and programs without disaster upon us, like, like you're doing here, like what these things, how do we continue to do this? How do we build liberation in our communities and for those other communities around us? And I don't know what the answers are, but I think that we are experimenting with these things. But I think that we need to ask the question over and over again. And stop worrying about resistance all the time and figure out how we're going to build it. So I'm going to talk about some ideas about what's next. Creating power from below. And these are just ideas. These are not the answers. Um, one, I think, is that we need a liberatory framework of like anarchy. Whatever you want to call it, whatever flavor, social libertarianism, it doesn't matter. The name does not matter. What matters is that it's the concepts and how we engage in this. And I think that we need to move from a politics of reaction to politics and engagements of possibilities. We need to start to imagine, like, like, like Porkfest is doing, and like some of y'all are doing here. I don't talk to a lot of people who are trying to build things. I think that we need to figure out how we can engage and what does the future look like? What, do, what does multiple futures look like? But not just for the people here, but what does it look like for the people of Detroit? What does it look like for the people of New Orleans? How do we work together to create liberation outside the state? And I don't know what the answers are, but I want us to think about it. And I think we begin to make long-term strategies beyond capitalism as we know it, beyond power uh, as we know it, and beyond civilization because you know what? Trading one economic system for another is all still predicated on cheap oil and, and, and for us in the South, access to water. Climate change is real and all empires fall. Capitalism will not stand as, as we know it today. At some point it will be gone. So what is it going to look like? What's the world going to look like? Or what are the worlds going to look like in our own communities when we do these things? And I think that every action that we take should engage with dual power. It should not only build and be a cooperative or a collective or a separate, it should fucking resist at the same time. And because there are people who are exploited by these systems every day that we don't have to know, we don't have to see them. We talk about having the boot on our neck, we don't know what the boot on our neck looks like. And I think that we need to create more liberatory spaces. And it's not just building cooperatives and collectives, but they must be liberatory. Now I'm going to talk about four little concepts really quickly about that. What does liberatory mean? They should all, like, if we build, if we build something, if it's a worker co-op, a food co-op, whatever, whatever it is, it should only exist as long as it's necessary for the communities that it serves. Once it stops doing that, then get rid of the damn thing. Just close it up. Otherwise, you end up with the nonprofit industrial complex, which is just part of the larger system. The second thing is it must be liberatory. If you pay anybody, you must pay a living wage. We all, if we build worker cooperatives, we need to pay ourselves a living wage. And that we must, we must think about multiple bottom lines. It's not just the dollars that we create, but also how do, how do we create those dollars, whatever, FRN, whatever it is you're trying to generate, I don't care, Bitcoin, whatever the financial thing is, but you must figure out how is it liberatory. Can you use that to help other communities? The other thing is that, it, that some of these things that we create must in my opinion, must bring us into conflict with the state. We can't just build 
uh, uh, hippy dippy stuff over here or, or a health clinic over there. We must, they, some of these things must bring us into conflict with the state. If they do not bring us into conflict with the state, they must support those that do. They've got to be a part of resistance movements. They can't be separate. I've been part of the co-op movement for a long time and often it's just in its own bubble. It has nothing to do with the rest of the world. Or I'm in resistance movements that happen. We have, you called it siloing earlier today. And I think it's important that like, they must be together. Resist and rebel. And the next thing is that they must be insurrectionary. Again, they should only list, they should only exist for as long as they, that they need to be. And so, largely, I want to, if you, if you don't take much away from this, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the state. Don't worry about the state. It doesn't matter what they do. If we create these liberatory ideas, we are willing to resist and build our power, it doesn't matter what they do. All the time that we worry about surveillance and worry about informants and worry about blah, 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 it takes our eyes off the prize of doing what we need to do. And every time that we do that, um, they, they win. And if we are afraid, we will not begin to push the limits. We will not challenge the state. We will only try to build our comfortableness within the state. And when I say don't be afraid, also challenge ourselves to think beyond, beyond the ideas that we have now. Porkfest is an amazing thing for me to see. I wish more people could see it, but it's not the only one. We need more of these everywhere in different ways. And there's other projects that other people are building that we need to see. But we need to challenge our imaginations about what we can build. And that, I think one of the other pieces is to be kind to ourselves along the way. Let's worry less about definitions and fighting, infighting about who is correct. Because when the shit matters, when it comes down, we all know what to do. All the labels will not matter. All the different ideologies won't matter. We'll have to sort them at some point. But when it matters, we all pull together. And that's what I saw after Hurricane Katrina. And the last piece I would say, but I don't have it on here, is to remember that I'm challenging us to be more than voters, more than consumers, and more than activists. There's all these paths in the middle that we have not even taken yet, and that we're going to build the road by walking, kind of what you're all doing here. We're going to build the road, and we don't know what it's going to be. But I think more importantly, there's no isolationism about anything, right? That this is what we need to do, keep organizing for collective liberation. And I'm going to end it here. Don't give in, don't give up, resist, rebel, create, and build, because our futures depend on it. Thank you so much.